Well, let's see. Um, I'm, first of all, let me say I'm delighted and this is on the yes. microphone. Yeah. Honored and delighted to be invited to participate in this multidisciplinary endeavor uh, by Professor Tom Levy and Ramesh, both of whom are uh, good friends of mine. And um, some of you may have, you know, Tom read out this elaborate uh, CV of mine, but um, um, I think that we also need to congratulate Tom, especially for a couple of things. Uh, he was just elected to the Academy, uh, which is a very prestigious honor, but even more impressive in my eyes is he, he discovered King Solomon's mines. <laughs> and and uh, when I was a child, uh, I was, it was my dream to become an archaeologist to discover uh, um, uh, King Solomon's mines and uh, El Dorado, El Dorado, uh, Shangri-La, which I later, later discovered doesn't exist, <laughs> and, and um, also cities in India like um, Hastinapura from the Mahabharata, and which people have discovered since then. Uh, so for me, it's reliving, uh, Tom here is reliving a childhood dream. But the other dream I had was to become a neuroscientist or biologist, and that I have partially fulfilled. Uh, but, you know, we Indians believe in reincarnation, so in my next incarnation, I'll be an archaeologist. <laughs> now, Tom asked me to give a talk on Indian art and neurology, and uh, these may seem almost antithetical or far removed from each other, and indeed they are, but I'm going to do what I can to try and bridge the gap between the two cultures, between the humanities and science. And I think the brain, in fact, is the interface between the two cultures. So I'm going to talk a lot about brain and also about Indian art. It's going to be a sort of montage or kaleidoscope of ideas, but hopefully you'll get something out of it. But to, before I begin on talking about neuroscience and art, mainly I'll talk about Indian art, because that's what I'm familiar with. But the same principles, I think, are applied to all, all types of art. Uh, in fact, the main theme of this lecture is there are artistic universals, that despite the staggering diversity of artistic styles across the world, you know, you've got Tibetan art, you've got Renaissance art, you've got Greek art, you've got um, Chola bronzes, which you're going to see many examples of, uh, you've got um, Matisse, you've got Van Gogh, you've got um, um, even um, Dada, which is not even art, or, you know, or a skull decorated with the diamonds which sold for $500 million recently, some of you may know. And I think it's art mocking itself. Um, art mocking itself, but, but you know, good that somebody's doing it. Okay, but what I'd like to do is put it all in historical context and uh, talk a little bit about history of India. And I, I'm taking a risk being uh, called jingoistic, but you really can't understand the, the ethos of Indian art and the spirit of Indian art without seeing it in proper uh, Indian context. So if you permit me, for about five or ten minutes, I'll just talk about India in general. Now, of course, we all enjoy, uh, we all know about India. This includes both Indians, immigrants, and Westerners. We think of, when you think of India, you think of cow worship, and you think of uh, yoga, and you think of meditation, and you think of curry, okay? These are the sort of stereotypes about India. And let's not underestimate curry, though, because... <laughs> Quite apart from we all enjoy it, but it's what drove civilization. The whole colonial enterprise, uh, you know, like Columbus, for example, went in search for spice. He went in search of India and uh, ended up here uh, accidentally. If he hadn't ended up here, the whole course of human history would have been different. It's interesting to contemplate what would have happened. And, you know, we wouldn't be having, I wouldn't have met Tom, we wouldn't be having this lecture, none of it. Okay, were it not for curry, so let's not underestimate its importance. Um, but beyond that, many, many Americans and, and in fact Westerners are curious about India, especially now that it's been a, become a global economic superpower, whatever that means. And uh, on that note, I'll mention that people, people associate poverty with India, but until about three or four centuries ago, it was one of the richest countries in the world. If you take the Golconda diamonds, just the diamond mines, uh, it was the richest country in the world until the marauding hordes of Englishmen invaded and took over the country and ended, engaged in a lot of looting and plundering of our treasures, especially the East India Company. But, you know, the famous diamonds, just to give you a glimpse of this, the Hope Diamond and the Kohinoor Diamond were from India, and all the, in fact, the only diamond mines in, in the world were in India. And the emperor of Vijayanagar, the king of Vijayanagar, uh, three, four, four or five centuries ago, 
every day he would sit on a, uh, what do you call them, a balance, on one side of the balance. On this other side of the balance, he would put gold coins to balance them out, and then he would give it to the poor. Just to tell you a little bit about the affluence of India, despite the current view that it's very impoverished and poor. Okay, I'm sort of going off on a tangent. I'll keep doing this throughout the lecture. Um, but regarding Indian uh, history and history of Indian culture, uh, I'll again mention, let me start with a story, okay? And, and I may have not got the details right, but because I'm remembering it from 10 years ago. Uh, it turns out that a great king in the third or fourth century AD during Gupta times, uh, though he was in some kind of trouble, I don't know exactly what, and um, he hired his minister of court, a man, a Brahmin minister, and he said, uh, can you get me out of trouble? And in fact, the Brahmin minister got him out of trouble. And he said, ask whatever you want, and it shall be yours. And remember, there's a lot of uh, first or second century AD, or maybe third or fourth century AD. And he said, anything I want? He said, anything you want. So he went back, and, he, and then he invented the game of chess, and he brought it back. And chess originates from India, as some of you may know, and gave it to the king. I said, look, I wanted you to ask for a reward. Not, I want you to ask for a reward, not give me another prize. You know, here is this wonderful game called chess. Uh, ask for your reward and it shall be yours. And he said, but you know, I'm just a poor Brahmin. I don't need a reward. He said, well, ask it anyway. And he said, well, since you insist, I want one grain of rice in the first square, two grains in the second square, four grains in the third square, eight grains in the fourth square, and so on and so forth, to finish all the squares. And the king said, well, this is absurd. That's all you want? And, 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 the, and the, uh, the, the Brahmin minister said, no, that's all I want. You know, I'm just a poor priest. And then, of course, his heralds and court mathematicians come, and they were using the ancient Greek system of arithmetic and mathematics. And they tried to do this multiplication. And after about eighth or ninth, Ramesh will tell you, eighth or ninth square, they just got into trouble. They just couldn't do the computation. It took hours and hours using the ancient European method. And then somebody came along and said, look, there is a method which was invented quite recently, uh, early millennium BC, or maybe just after the birth of Christ, which is called mathematics, arithmetic. And it uses a completely different system. Use that and you shall be able to calculate what's going on. And that was the dawn of arithmetic. I mean, when we think of arithmetic, we usually think of, um, when you think of India, you think of zero. Nothing came from India, right? Zero came from India. But this is a misconception. Of course, zero did come from India, but it's known in other cultures. What's critical uh, is th four concepts being simultaneously there. W and that's happened only in India. One is place value. You say 562, it's 5 multiplied by 100, 6 multiplied by 10, and 2 multiplied by 1. And this is what really got mathematics going, arithmetic going, and therefore mathematics going. And secondly, base 10. The Sumerians had mathematics, but they used base 60, which is very cumbersome. And so in other words, we have 1 to 10. And then we have separate numerals, separate graphemes for each of the 10 numbers. And they're lucky in choosing a compact system of 10 numbers, what we call the decimal system. And lastly, of course, the invention of zero. And not merely zero to stand for nothing, but zero as a place marker. So 509 means 5 into 100. And the second place, there's nothing. So zero used as a place marker. And 2, 2 multiplied by 1. And this, of course, revolutionized was a major revolution. Einstein has called it the most important discovery in all of human history, the invention of num the number system and zero. And then, of course, rest is history, and Ramesh will tell you it's all, you know, all computers, everything. Modern civilization depends on the invention of arithmetic and, and mathematics. But what's less well known is um, other aspects of Indian culture. For example, um, Sanskrit, which uh, some of you here I know are Sanskrit scholars, so I may be uh, out of my depth here, but uh, it's probably the most ancient systematized language. And Panini, the famous Sanskrit scholar in the second, third century BC, Panini, not to be confused with the bread panini, which is an Italian bread, uh, Panini was the first person that's regarded as a father of linguistics and discovered syntactic structure and classified phonemes into, uh, um, um, what do you call the two things? Vowels and consonants and all of that, and subsequently came up with the grammar and linguistics. And then, of course, as you know, the, the, Sansk uh, the Latin and Greek were offshoots. When I say offshoots, I don't mean degenerate offshoots, but sophisticated offshoots of Sanskrit. 
in, in India, Sanskrit was preserved in its pristine isolation through an oral tradition. And one of the things Tom and I have been talking about is reviving this tradition at UCSD and maybe uh, reenact some of the old glorious Sanskrit plays like Shakuntala, which is around the 5th century AD during the Gupta period. Okay, now you can say that's all fine. We talked about Sanskrit and chess and mathematics, all of which are important contributions to civilization. And then I could go on and on and on, but that's another lecture which I won't go into. Um, but I will mention a couple of things unique about ancient cultures like India and indeed the Semitic cultures in Babylon and Sumeria and, and all of that, as opposed to contemporary, I don't want to say America, but Western civilizations and cultures, um, is two things I want to point out. One is continuity and the other is harmony. This is slightly different. By continuity I mean, if you go to Greece, you have um, Zeus, you have ancient Greek mythology, but you don't have a guy named Zeus. And you don't go to a temple and worship Apollo or Zeus. And you don't have music chanting Zeus's name. What's unique about Indian tradition, and probably in this regard is probably the oldest such tradition, is you can trace the lineage of ideas and culture and music and literature all the way back to the first, second millennium BC. For example, you see Shiva, the Lord Shiva, in Indus Valley seals. That was about three, third millennium BC. And even now, my gardener is called Shiva in India. So this continuity is what is unique about Indian culture and indeed human culture and civilization uh, all over the world, but especially in India and as I said, in other ancient cultures throughout the world. The second point I want to make is harmony. And this is a little bit more subtle, but again, obvious to many of you here, but maybe not to all of you. When I go to India, the place I was born, in Mylapur, is, a, is, is just about a 10-minute walk from Kabbalishwaran Temple, which goes back to the first millennium BC. And you go there, you still see scholars, Vedic scholars, chanting Vedas going back to the second, third millennium BC, at least first millennium BC. And they're still chanting, the same Brahmin boys sitting, sitting there and chanting the same Vedas. And then you see, of course, the gods and goddesses. You see a sculpture of Shiva, and you get people going and worshipping Shiva. And then there is the temple god whose name is Shiva, right? And you go see a Bharatanatyam dance in the temple, and the dance goes back to first millennium BC. The sage Bharata is the person who created this dance and systematized it. And that dance continues today. You can walk into a temple and see the Dhananjayas or somebody dancing and showing you the cosmic dance of Shiva in their dance. This sort of continuity of music, lyric, lore, mythology, dance, um, religion, uh, all of this is unique to some of the ancient cultures like India and China and the Semitic cultures. And I think that's very important because you say, well, what's a big deal? What's so big about, what's a big deal about harmony and continuity? Why should we celebrate it? Because it's what makes us, makes us uniquely human. If you, if you were to ask what single characteristic makes us uniquely human, it is culture and the con continuity of tradition that's, that's the core of culture, right? Because otherwise we would be slightly different from apes, but not without hair. But, you know, it's, it's your brain and the cultural continuity that characterizes uh, us humans. And, of course, culture is universal if you leave out Texas. <laughs> okay, so... Um, we talked about mathematics, culture continuity, uh, harmony, resonance, and um, now let's go on to Indian art, which is the main topic of this lecture. Uh, how did I get into all this? Well, I'm mainly a neuroscientist studying the brain, and I dabble in art. So there may be professional art historians here. Uh, so I, I, I'm, you know, correct me if I if I say something anything anything absurd, which I might <laughs> very well do, but. I was sitting, I was, went to, I go to sabbatical once every two or three years in India, and I was sitting in this temple uh, watch, looking at all these sculptures. And normally I think of this as, you know, I was raised uh, being educated partly in India, but later in the West, in Cambridge, England, and subsequently the United States. So I would look at these sculptures and regard them mainly as religious iconography, right? So I would see a sculpture of Parvati or Shiva. It was iconography, not fine art, to use the Western expression. But something about these great works of art started haunting me day and night. And I would wake up in the middle of a, in my sleep at night and I'd say, my God, there's a Shiva. And then, my God, there's a Parvati. So what happened? There was a sort of epiphany. And then I started thinking about this as a neuroscientist, as a scientist, and said, why do some works of art have the ability to move you to tears, to, um, to shake you to the very core? What's special about these great works of art, be it a Michelangelo or a Chola Bronze? 
So what's going on in the brain? That's what I started thinking about. And then I said, well, for example, then I started looking at the history of ideas about Indian art. If you're entering a new field, it's a, it's a good idea to look at uh, history of ideas, the lineage of ideas. And I looked at some of the bronzes, which South India is famous for. This is from the Chola dynasty. Uh, Chola art is famous for its bronzes, especially also for stone sculptures, but especially for its bronzes. And this whole exhibit, as you know, is uh, Tom and Alina's brainchild. Uh, they actually, what I've been calling the continuity of tradition and culture, they went and did uh, ethno-archaeology in India, in Swami Malai, where this tradition has continued for a thousand years. Probably earlier than that, going back to Vishwakarma, uh, going back to the you know, ancient times. So, um, so I looked at these sculptures and I just looked at the history of ideas about this. And you know, the English came here during Victorian times, came to India, and they were appalled by this. I should say there were two waves of Englishmen. Initially, there, was, there were very enlightened Englishmen, the English aristocracy, William Jones, uh, Havel, and people like that, who William Jones, in fact, quote unquote, discovered Sanskrit. And he was the one who said it's more perfect and more beautiful in some ways than Greek and Latin, whether you agree with him or not. He was the founder of linguistics and philology, uh, apart from Panini in the first millennium BC, and comparative linguistics. He founded the science of comparative linguistic, William Jones. So hats off to William Jones. So then I looked at the history of subsequent uh, invaders from England, uh, especially the Hoi Polai connected with the um, uh, East India Company. And they looked at some of these bronzes and they said, my God, they're hideous, right? So for example, here is Parvati, the, the consort of Shiva, who according to the Chola bronze artist is a very epitome of feminine grace, poise, sensuality, everything good about being a woman, right? So the perfection of womanhood. So now the, the um, Victorian Englishman comes and looks at it and he says, my God, it's, it's hideous because it's abnormal. It doesn't look realistic like a real woman. It's got hips that are too big. The waist is too narrow like an hourglass. The breasts are exaggerated. There's something you know, not quite real about that woman. And of, course, and of course, they said the same thing about Mughal miniature paintings, medieval Indian sculpture like that from Rajasthan from around the 10th or 11th century, saying that the proportions are all exaggerated. And of course, in saying this, they're missing the whole point of art because everybody here knows that the point of art is not realism, is not to go and copy something that. I mean, I can take a, a $10 camera these days and then take a photograph of uh, Tom here and you won't give me a dollar for it. Okay, even though it's super realistic and all of that. So art is not about realism, nothing personal. <laughs> art, is about, <laughs> art is about deliberate exaggeration, hyperbole, even distortion of the image to evoke specific moods and sentiments in the human brain. And this, when I looked at the, by the way, just as an aside, these same Englishmen, same Westerners who criticized Indian art for not being realistic. It doesn't look like a real woman, they said. You come to the 20th century, early 20th century, and you get to Picasso. Now that doesn't look like a real woman to me. I don't know about you, right? It's got a hunchback, it's got a you know, face, two eyes on one side of a face like a flounder, and it's got a club foot, and everything is distorted about it. And what did the Western critics say? They said, my God, what a genius, work of genius, because he has liberated us from the tyranny of realism and recognize that's not what art is about. Well, guess what? That's what the Chola artists knew. And in fact, going back a thousand years earlier, that art has nothing to do with realism. An even greater irony is if you go to Victorian times, the same Englishman who was criticizing Indian Chola bronzes saying the waist is too narrow and the hips are too big and the breasts are too big, you go and look at his wife. Okay? What he did was he insisted on them having their ribs removed. I've seen these, 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 these clothes in the Hunterian Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons where they still and they have the skeletons of these women with the ribs missing. So this is hypocrisy. The same guys who are criticizing the bronze, saying the waist is too attenuated, was doing the same thing to his wife. Okay? Just a rhetorical remark there. Now, and when I gave this lecture to the Getty not long ago, there's an Englishman in the audience who raised his hand, English art historians, and he said, but Professor Ramachandran, surely when Picasso did this, his nudes, 
He knew what he was doing. He was doing it deliberately. Whereas the taller artist may have just got it wrong. Okay? And I said, believe me, the taller artist knew perfectly well what he was doing. His goal was not to copy a woman. You know, if you want to copy something, just walk around looking at women. Why do you need art? Right? You can look at photographs. The whole purpose of art is lost if you want to copy something and emphasize realism. And then, and then I pointed out to him, if you want realism, in fact, you can go back to the third millennium BC and look at Indus Valley. Right? So Indian artists knew very well what real, how to produce realistic art. This is a terracotta bust going back to the second millennium BC in the Indus Valley, and it's wonderfully realistic. In fact, it's more realistic than any Greek or Renaissance sculpture, because look at this tummy. This is what real men look like, okay? <laughs> Not like those Greek gods with their muscles and flat abs, you know, uh, okay? So knew, they knew perfectly well what realism was, and they conveyed it, but they also knew about abstraction. Look at that bronze from the Indus Valley. If you saw that in a modern art gallery in Madison Avenue in New York, you'd pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for it, right? And it's showing you a dancing girl in bronze. Okay, so they knew about abstraction as well. And then by, you get, by the time you get to medieval times, there are various shades of this, sometimes half realistic, half abstract. For example, that is slightly exaggerated, but you can see it's also realistic. And that's from probably from Rajasthan or Uttar Pradesh. I don't know if Sonia is here. She would, she would give us the answer, but... That's around 10th or 11th century. And by the time you get to tantric art, uh, early part of this century, sorry, early part of the, this millennium, you get into completely abstract art in India. Uh, it's called tantric art, which is supposed to evoke moods and sentiments in your brain without necessarily representing anything real. I mean, that's the key. Now, then I said, well, if art's not real, meant to convey realism, what the hell is it? And I'm a scientist, I'm a neuroscientist, what is it then? So I was looking over Sanskrit art manuals, Sanskrit manuals on art, which again go back a long time, goes back to Sage Bharata in the first millennium BC, and later in Abhinava Gupta, I think it's 10th century AD, I'm not quite sure, it could be 9th or 11th, but around the 10th century AD. And if you look at these Sanskrit art manuals, there is a recurring word called rasa. And rasa is a word that's difficult to translate, but what it roughly means is capturing the very soul, the essence, the spirit of something, to convey a specific mood, sentiment, or emotion in the viewer's brain. So that, that entire sentence is encompassed in that one word, Rasa. You can convey it through a dance. Shobha is going to do this maybe about a couple of months from now in January. We're still getting it organized, but Shobha is a very distinguished dance exponent, and she might um, be doing this dance a couple of months from now. And I invite you all to be here if, if that happens. Um, so, I mean, there's some details about the venue needs to be sorted out, but I'm sure it'll be sorted out. Um, so what is rasa? As I said, it's to, let me give you some examples. Traditionally, there are nine rasas, but we can sort of expand on that. Uh, for example, here you've got two lovers, celestial lovers, uh, in, in, from Kajuraho, right? And probably medieval times, probably 11th, 10th century. And you can see that it's two lovers gazing into each other's eyes in everlasting intimacy. Right? And there is something otherworldly about their eyes. That's part of the uh, beauty of Indian sculpture. It's, not, it's, re, it's human and yet divine. And notice how he's holding her chin. So this is supposed to represent the rasa of amorous ecstasy, sensuality, sexual intimacy, love. Okay? So he's holding her chin, raising it towards him, uh, a sort of long-anticipated kiss. Right? But she's not quite ready. Look at, she's holding his hand there and holding on to it, so saying, not quite yet, right? So there is this palpable erotic tension being built up as you look at that image, and that's part of the power of that visual image, of that sculpture. And initially, it's not obvious what's going on, but when you, when you look at it carefully, the artist has used all these devices. So this is to evoke the Sringara rasa, or Kama rasa, okay? And similarly, you can go on and on. There's another example of Kama rasa, that is the Lord Kama, and with his arrow, like, essentially like Cupid, there's a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas between Europe and India at that time. It's not clear which way it went, but it doesn't matter. And you can see the torsion of his body, the contortion of his body as he's releasing the bow from his, sorry, releasing the arrow from his bow uh, at these nymphs who are sort of contorted in erotic, in conveying this erotic tension that's going on in that image. And I think it's one of the most, one of my favorite images of medieval art. 
Now, okay, so then the question is, as a neuroscientist and as a, as a connoisseur of art, what's going on in the brain? To tell you the truth, nobody has the foggiest idea. But I got a couple of few hunches, and I'm going to tell you about that. So I was sitting near the temple uh, precincts, and I was saying to myself, what is it about these images, the Chola bronze, bronzes or medieval Indian art, that evokes such powerful emotions in your brain? What is it? What are, are there artistic universals? In other words, you've got this tremendous diversity, uh, bewildering diversity of, of different artistic styles. But in spite of that, are there any common principles that cut across cultural boundaries? And in saying this, I want to emphasize that nobody's denying the tremendous importance of culture in art. Otherwise, there wouldn't be art history, right? You've got Indian art, you've got Tibetan art, you've got Monet, you've got uh, Renaissance art, you've got uh, Impressionism, you've got Expressionism, and all of that stuff, right? So no one is denying the importance of culture, but as a scientist, I'm interested in what is common across cultures. Is there a universal grammar of, 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 of art that transcends, cult uh, transcends culture? And I also want to emphasize this is really about the universal grammar of aesthetics rather than art. Because once you start talking about art, there's an element of arbitrariness and marketing and all of that that comes in, which we can't deal with as scientists. I mean, you can take a pig and put a diamond on it and charge $5 million for it, as Damien Hirst recently did, right? And then you can call it art. So, and then you can, you know, the, the Chola Natraja, you can get a good Chola Natraja for about $2 million or $1 million. Why you call it Natraja, uh, well, because you call it an art, but why would a pig with a diamond on it fetch five, $500 million and an Atraja fetch $2 million is wholly unclear to me. Uh, maybe somebody in the audience can explain it to me. So this shows that there's a tremendous arbitrariness to art. So I'm going to stay away from art and talk mainly about aesthetics, the neuroscience of aesthetics, and then we'll return to Chola Bronzes, which is the main theme of the exhibit. Okay, so what are these laws of art? Now, as I said, it, it cuts across cultural boundaries. In fact, it cuts across phylogenetic boundaries. Animals have art, birds have art, right? If you go to the New Guinea in Australia, you've got the bower bird, which is a nondescript uh, bachelor bower bird, very, very nondescript looking guy, not in the least attractive, and he has to impress the female. Now, how does he do it? Most male birds have this colorful feathers and all of that, and, and a dance, and bower bird doesn't do that. What he does is build elaborate bachelor pads with, with jewelry, you know, he takes a little bit of cigarette foil, if he can find it, he puts it there, berries of red, and he puts it all in one corner, grouping them. They even have lawns. The bowers are this big. The bird is this big. And he constructs his elaborate bower to impress his mate. Okay? So if you look at it, it looks very, very aesthetically pleasing. You could, if you didn't tell anybody and you put it in a Madison gallery, somebody might pay a few thousand dollars to buy, purchase this, and not realizing it's created by a bird brain. Okay? <laughs> so this emphasizes that the, the, these principles of art cut across cultural boundaries, and in fact, take something much simpler. Why do you find birds of paradise or butterflies beautiful? Butterflies are not interested in looking beautiful to humans. They evolved to look beautiful to other butterflies. And the butterfly's brain diverged from your brain about 600 million years ago, you know, going back earlier than Devonian times, pre-Cambrian times. And yet they have the same aesthetic principles, like symmetry and color, that you and I do, because of this, what I'm calling aesthetic universals. Okay? So what are these universals? I'm just going to have a stab at it, and given our time limits, only got, going to talk about three or four universals, not all of them. One of my favorites is what I call peak shift, or hyperbole. And of course, this relates to what I said earlier about art. It's not about realism, not about representation, although that does have a role, but mainly about hyperbole and exaggeration and distortion. Now, when I say hyperbole and distortion, you can't take something, a person, or a nude, or an animal, or a... Uh, landscape and randomly distort it and call it art, although they do it in La Jolla, right? But, but you, it has to be in a systematic direction. That's what makes refined art. So then the question is, what do you mean by systematic directions? And science, discoveries come from unexpected insights, come from unexpected sources. And my, okay, before I get into aesthetic universals, a word about visual perception. You can't understand visual art. How does the art create images that disturb you, that are aesthetically pleasing. You can't understand that without understanding something about vision, just regular vision, and how the brain sees things. Now, people think of vision as something quite simple. I, mean, I was talking to a priest the other day when I was flying to uh, San Francisco from San Diego and Southwest Airlines. 
And he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I study perception. I study the brain and I study vision and perception. He said, what, what's there to study? And I said, well, what do you think happens in your brain when you look at something? He said, well, you look at this cup of tea and there's an image on my eye and my retina and it's sent through this cable called the optic nerve and it's made right side up because it's upside down in the eye. And then you display it on a screen in the brain, kind of like visual area of the brain. Now, there's a fundamental fallacy here because if you display an image on the brain, then you need, another little guy to, you need another little guy to look at that image. And there is no little guy in your head, just a slab of meat with 100, 100 billion neurons, right? So the pattern of firing of these neurons represents the object. There's no picture in the brain. And if you had a little guy looking at it, that doesn't solve the problem because you need another little guy in his head. And this goes, goes on and on, ad infinitum. And you don't really solve the problem of perception. So this suggests that perception is an extraordinarily complex process. In fact, in the human brain, People think of perception as taking place here, but in fact, that in area, area, visual area. But in fact, there are 30 visual areas in the primate brain, probably more in the human brain. 30 areas handling different aspects of vision. And there's a progressive refinement in your uh, translation of the optic image in the retina to the final act, aha, of perceiving the object. There are umpteen stages in between. So, this is what makes art possible, because if you're just sending an image and displaying it on the screen, art wouldn't work, right? So what you need is to change the image in specific ways to more optimally titillate the visual centers in the brain and to send signals to your reward centers in the brain, to the limbic structures, to say, aha, right? So that all of these different laws of art I'm talking about are stimulating these different 30 different areas more optimally than you could do with just looking at a person. That's why art is special. It's doing much more than just looking at just the world or looking at people. That's what makes art special. So what are these laws of art? This is just to emphasize that vision is not simply transmitting an image to your brain. There's much more going on. If you look at that, it's a famous uh, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law figure. And some of you see the young lady with the chin, with the ear, the nose. How many of you see that? The young lady, okay. Most of you here, especially the men. How many of you see the old lady in this image? Only two or three. Okay, let me explain. The young lady's neck is the old lady's chin. And that, that becomes the old lady's mouth. And the old lady, young lady's chin becomes the old lady's nose. Okay? So the point I'm trying to make is that the image is constant in your eye, but your perception completely changes. I mean, every act of perception involves judgment by the observer. It involves forming an opinion on the state of affairs in the world. It's not a passive transmission of an image and being displayed in the brain. And that's why the artist can manipulate the image to create pleasing effects in your brain. So what are these laws of art? Let's take a few examples. Peak shift or hyperbole, what do I mean by that? Peak shift, what do I mean by that? Well, it's a very simple law, which comes from animal behavior in rats, believe it or not. So if you t train a rat to discriminate a square from a rectangle, give it cheese every time it sees a rectangle, very soon it starts going to just the rectangle. It learns the rectangle means food. Fine, okay, this is classical Skinnerian behaviorism. But if you make a rectangle, after it's been trained, after the rat's been trained to distinguish a square from a rectangle, rectangle means reward, you give it a longer, skinnier rectangle, the rat prefers this to this. Now that's very odd. It's kind of stupid because the rat's been shown a rectangle and taught that means food. Why does it prefer a longer, skinnier one to the original? The answer is not stupid at all because what the rat has learned is a rule, rectangularity, right? So if the aspect ratio is different, then it's a rectangle. So it's learned the rule. And this is even more rectangular because the aspect ratio is even higher. So it says, my God, what a rectangle. And it goes for that. So in other words, the rat is learning. This is called peak shift because the peak response is shifted away from what the rat was taught. Now you say, well, what the hell does that got to do with human art and vision? Well, let me explain. Take caricature. What do you do in caricature? Suppose you wanted to make a caricature of Bush or Nixon or anybody. Let's say Nixon. What you do is you take the average human face and then you subtract it from Nixon's face to get what's special about Nixon, his huge bulbous nose, his shaggy eyebrows, and then you amplify the difference. And then you capture the rasa of Nixon, okay? The essential aspects of Nixon. 
That's why the caricature looks even more like Nixon than Nixon himself. Okay? Now you say, well, that's fine, but that's a cartoon. Well, if you do the exaggeration just right, and only a genius like Rembrandt can do this, you get great portraiture or caricature. Sorry, great portraiture. If you overdo it, then you get caricature, which is not what Rembrandt was doing. Now, what's this got to do with Chola bronzes? Well, same thing. What the Chola artist is doing, taking a woman and saying, what's special about a woman? What makes a difference from a man? So taking the average man and subtracting him from the average woman, and of course, it's the bigger breasts, the bigger hips, and narrow waist, and he amplifies it, and in fact, titillates your brain, and makes you say, my God, what a woman, what a beautiful woman. But that's not all there is to it, otherwise you just look like a pinup, right? What there is going on here is, there's also the elegance of posture, what we call the bhanga. And she's holding a beautiful rose in her fingers, a phantom rose, okay? And, and then the, the, the separation of the left arm from the, from the thigh. All of this is, these are very elegant artistic devices that the artist has used to convey, because a woman also has poise and grace. It's not just that she's voluptuous and she looks like a woman. She's also got poise and grace. How does he do this? He goes into an abstract mathematical space. You see, there are some poses that a guy cannot adopt even if he tries. If I do this, this is because of the pelvic anatomy, the angle between the neck of the femur and the shaft of the femur, so I can't do it even if I try. But a woman can do it effortlessly. So he goes into that posture space, and then he subtracts the male form from the female form and exaggerates that posture, right? And that's why he's conveying that rasa of elegance and feminine grace and dignity and poise and many other devices which I won't go into. Now, same thing here. She looks completely unrealistic. No, one, no woman has a waist like that or breast that big or hips that big. Well, maybe some women do, but most of them don't. Okay. And what, he, what the artist has done is exaggerated and amplified that, but the result is not a comical caricature. It's a great work of art in the Metropolitan Museum where you can see also her playful expression, and she's dancing in, in abandon, and you can see the twist of the torso, in fact an exaggerated twist of the torso, conveying this movement and, and sense of dance and playfulness all in that one sculpture. Okay, then you say, well, this is all fine, Dr. Ramachandran, but what about abstract art? What about uh, 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 Rodin, which is sort of semi-realistic, it's not even realistic? What about Henry Moore, which is not realistic? How do you begin to explain, or a Van Gogh? or, a, or a, a, a Miro. How do you explain these types of art using your model? Because there's no realism there. Well, I can, or I can give it a shot. And if you go into ethology, and this is where unexpected insights come from when you're doing, a, doing science. Um, in ethology, if you go back to Oxford uh, about 50 years ago, uh, an ethologist named Tim Bergen, who got, Nobel, who got a Nobel Prize for this work, was looking at seagulls. You see these on our coast here. They're called herring gulls. They've got a yellow beak with a red spot. Now, as soon as the seagull's chick hatches, it goes and starts pecking at that red spot immediately. And the seagull then regurgitates half-digested food into the gaping chick's mouth. The chick swallows the food, and he's happy. So Tim Bergen asked a question which a child would ask, but most adults wouldn't. That is, how does the chick know who's an adult seagull with, with, with a beak full of food? Right? So Tim Bergen did the obvious experiment. He plucked the beak off the seagull, I mean, presumably after it was dead. And then he, he was this, here was this ethologist waving this beak in front of the chick. And the chick continues to beg for food, even though there's this, this guy holding, there's no seagull. There's only this beak. So that means as far as seagull is concerned, that is mom, that beak. And you say, well, that's weird. Why would it think a disembodied beak is, is mom? That's kind of stupid. Well, it's not stupid because what the goal of vision and perception is to do as little computation as you need to do for the job in hand, using shortcuts if necessary, using heuristics. And in this case, you can take advantage of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution to, to wire in your brain a primitive template. And that is the only time, statistically, I'm going to see that long thing with a red spot, is when there's a mother attached. So why do I need to worry about the entire mother, whenever I see that beak with a red spot, I'll beg for food. Because beak means mom. I'm not going to encounter a beak. I'm not going to encounter a malicious ethologist waving a beak in, 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 in nature, nor a pig with a mutant pig with a beak. Okay, in nature, I'll always see it with a mom, so I can, I can avoid the computational burden of processing the entire mom and just look at the beak. But now comes the clincher. What Timbergen found was, forget about the beak. 
you take a long yellow stick with a red spot, the chicks still go to it. Because the system in the brain, the template, has a tolerance. Just like you can use a rusty key to open a lock, it doesn't have to be perfect. So the neuronal systems in the brain are not perfect. You just give a yellow rod with a spot, still the chick gets fooled and goes and begs for food. But now, the bottom line, Tim Buckingham took a long yellow stick and put three red stripes on it. And the chicks go crazy. They go berserk. And all of them are attracted to it like a magnet, and they all congregate and start pecking incessantly, preferring that to the original bee, and indeed to the mother. We said, that's really stupid. Why did this thing doesn't even look like a beak, right? Why is it preferring this? Why is it fetishizing this object? The answer is, we don't know the, what the grammar of vision is, what the neurons are doing. Maybe they have a rule that says the more red contour, the better. So what you've done is you've created Timbergen without realizing it, has accidentally stumbled on a super beak, which is actually more optimally stimulating these beak neurons in the brain than a real beak, and this gives a jolt to the chick's limbic system saying, wow, what a sexy beak, right? And it goes crazy and starts fetishizing this object. Now you say, what's this got to do with human art? Well, let me tell you. Again, it's deviating from realism. This is what all of you, all of you, in other words, if the seagull chick had an art gallery, if seagulls had an art gallery, they would hang the stick with the three stripes on the wall, pay hundreds of millions of dollars, worship it, and regard it as a great work of abstract art. In other words, what I'm saying is that the great works of abstract art, the great artists like Picasso or Monet or all of these people, or Rodin or Henry Moore, they've discovered the figural primitives, the equivalent of this long stick with the three stripes for your human brain. And then they're playing with these primitives. That's what's going on. And that's what you're doing when you go to these contemporary art galleries and playing, paying thousands of dollars to buy these abstract works. So you're behaving exactly like a bird brain, like a chick's brain. Okay? okay, you can see many examples of that. I can give you Henry Moore, and you can ask yourself, what primitives is it activating in your brain? And we can make, you can speculate on that, but I won't go into it. Uh, another principle I want to tell you about art is uh, contrast. Oops. It doesn't go backwards, by the way. Okay, good. This is, of course, a Miro, and contrast is essential. So I'm going through a list of my laws, one by one. I'm going to tell you about four laws, given our time limitations. So another law of art is contrast. And, and by the way, I'm talking more about aesthetics, again, to emphasize aesthetics and design, rather than art per se. But the same, they overlap to a great extent. So the same principles also apply to art, to a significant extent. So if you're talking about design, for example, or some types of art, Contrast is very important. If I wore a, a tie of the same color, you wouldn't find it interesting or, or alerting or artistic or aesthetically pleasing. It's fortunate there's all this contrast going on, which makes it interesting. So the minimum requirement for art is contrast. And this is sort of obvious, and you can say it and see it in some types of art, like this example from Miro, uh, which is one of, my most, one of my favorites. Another one, again, from Miro. So here you have contrast not just of luminance, but of color. Now, closely, another principle of art is perceptual grouping. And what I'm claiming is each of these areas is performing different types of computation on the visual image. And when it succeeds, it sends you an aha jolt to your limbic structures. And, and then each of these processes is separately linked to the limbic structures to give you this aesthetic jolt. So, for example, when you look at this, mostly people see just a bunch of blobs, except psych undergraduates who have seen this hundreds of times. But those of you who are not psych undergraduates, what do you see? Dalmatian. Okay, Dalmatian. You've seen, have you seen it before? No, no. no? Okay, you're good. I'm okay. Colorblind. You're colorblind. <laughs> That's nothing to do with this. But <laughs> <laughs> So here you see a Dalmatian dog sniffing the ground. How many of you start seeing it? Raise your hands. Okay, it takes a little bit of time. But once you grasp it, it's a, so you haven't seen it yet? Now I see. You do, yeah. Once you see it, you get this aha jolt. So in perception, there is a problem-solving aspect to perception. And the struggle to discover it and the final climactic aha is very pleasing to the eye. And many artists explore this, exploit this. It's called perceptual problem-solving. And we'll see its relevance. You may say, what's it, what's it got with Chola bronzes? But we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay? So we talked about contrast in, in perception. We've talked about uh, in design. Okay? We've talked about perceptual problem-solving. And I've shown you an image. Let's take contrast. 
I just talk, talked to you about my tie, and I talked to you about miho, right? But what about uh, Indian sculpture? Well, you can have contrast, not just of color and of luminance, but in higher dimensions, like texture. So what the artist has done here very cleverly, first of all, of course, there's peak shift and all that, and the necklace is flying off her chest, which gives it this sense of movement and dance. These are all very subtle. You don't realize it when you first look at it. But also, notice that her smooth, supple flesh of her nude body contrasts with the Baroque jewelry, on her, enhancing the smoothness and suppleness of her skin and sensuality of her skin. So these are all, again, artistic devices. That the, and this is often used in medieval sculptures, indeed even Shola bronzes. You'll see Parvati, but you see one strand of necklace accentuating her feminine grace and her skin, in some way, the smoothness of her skin. Now, another principle of art, and I told you about uh, contrast and grouping. So you just saw an example of contrast. Let's go back to grouping. Something wrong with this. Grouping. Now, what's this got to do with art and design? Well, let's go back to my tie. Let's take design. The purpose of vision, it turns out, when you evolved up in the treetops. By the way, I have a strong evolutionary approach to many of these problems. I believe strongly in evolution of the human brain through natural selection. I don't believe in intelligent design. And it's odd that our president has been championing this view, uh, given that his own existence is a living negation of intelligent design. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back to evolution. The goal of, goal of perception is to discover objects and discover object boundaries. And if you look at evolution all the time, creatures are trying to disguise themselves. It's called camouflage. So you've got a leopard with a bunch of... So you see, let's say you see a lion behind foliage. All the brain sees a bunch of yellow splotches. You don't know it's a lion. It'd just be a bunch of yellow splotches. But the brain says, your visual areas, what's the likelihood that these are all identical yellow splotches by, by chance? Zero. They must all belong to one object. Let me group them like you just grouped them here. When you group it, you say, my God, it's a lion. Let me get out of here. Okay? So it's all about discovering objects and object boundaries. So this is what, believe it or not, every time this sales girl or salesman in Nordstrom's picks this tie for me and says, look, the blue matches this, you're harking back to the fact that your, your ancestral primates were dodging lions. He's tapping into that principle. It's not some arbitrary marketing device. Okay? And of course, the same thing when you choose a mat for a painting. You deliberately choose, if it's got some green in it, you pick out the green in your mat. So what the hell does that mean, pick it out? Is that some arbitrary hype marketing? Or is it reflecting some deep brain principle? And I'm ans answering that question and saying it's reflecting some deep principle uh, of organization in the brain. Okay. Um, another principle of art is what I call the principle of isolation. Now what do I mean by that? Well, one of the well-known aspects of art is the famous remark of less is more. The art of understatement, whether in literature, poetry, or in visual art. So this contradicts what I said about peak shift. There I'm talking about exaggeration of hyperbole. Now I'm talking about understatement. Well, aren't these laws antithetical? So there's a paradox. But in science, often you try to resolve paradoxes. It's not really a paradox, because when you think about what's going on when you when you see a visual image or a great work of art, if you have a visual scene, and then keep in mind that the brain has limited attentional capacity. Even though there are 100 billion neurons, at any given time, only one pattern can sustain. One pattern can, be, then it can exist, which means there's a bottleneck of attention. You can't pay attention to multiple images at the same time. So when you look at a person, for example, your visual, so the question is this, why is it that that girl there, it's a sketch from a book I just picked out, or a little doodle of a, of a, of a, of a bull by Picasso, or a nude by Klimt, you know, we think of paintings, but they used to make little doodles with just one little line, is much more evocative of, of this nude than a Playboy pinup, and much more aesthetically pleasing than a Chippendale pinup or a Playboy pinup. Now why would that be? After all, the Playboy or Chippendale pinup it's got color, it's got shape, it's got shading, and all of that. It's going to evoke multiple activity in your brain. Therefore, it should be more powerful and give you a big jolt. But it, in fact, the little doodle of Picasso or Klimt, or this doodle here, is more evocative. Why would that be? Why would understatement be effective? The answer is when you look at a real image or a very colorful shaded image, the brain, given its limited attentional capacity, is not able to pay attention to the critical dimensions. 
what sets that image apart from other images, other similar images. So what the artist is doing is eliminating all the clutter from image. So a nude has the same skin as anybody else, right? What's critical about her is the outline or the form. She has the same color, she has the same skin, she has the same hair, but all of that is irrelevant to her beauty as a nude. So what the artist is doing is just taking the outline and introducing peak shifts so your brain is set up in resonance. Here is a drawing by an eight-year-old autistic child who can't interact with people, there's no language, and is quote-unquote retarded, which conveys the rasa of a horse. It's leaping out from the canvas, it's got movement, it's got energy. What's essential about a horse is captured. And that, believe it or not, believe it or not, is a horse drawn by the great Renaissance genius, Leonardo da Vinci. And if I hadn't told you that, and I've done surveys on people, majority of people pick that as being more elegant than that. They said this is life, it's animated, it's jumping out, it's got too many lines in it and it's too busy. So how is it possible that a retarded autistic child creates a greater work of art than a Renaissance genius? The answer is the principle of isolation. So what's happened in the autistic child is many of the other brain modules are functioning subnormally or not optimally. So all the attentional resources are now diverted to the single island of cortical tissue. It turns out that your right parietal is involved in your sense of artistic proportion. So all your attention is shifted to the right parietal and that is now hyper functioning. So this person creates all these amazing works of art uh, conveying the essential aspects of, of a horse. Okay, now that's another example of understatement and also combining different laws. Here you have perceptual problem solving. Initially it doesn't look like anything, but then of course you soon start seeing a nude and it's much more evocative than a Playboy pinup, for example, for the same reason of the importance of perceptual problem solving and understatement in art. Uh, now we can move on to some other images. And here again you see this element of building up tension, perceptual problem solving. There are other principles going on like closure, which are other gestalt principles I don't have time to go into. But notice that she's about to kiss him, but not quite kissing him. This builds up anticipation. But notice also that he's trying to strip off her jeans, holding it very elegantly between his index finger and, and thumb, about to strip off her jeans. And yet, she is holding on tight to the jeans and saying, not yet, not yet. Okay? So this is what builds up that erotic tension while you watch that image. It's a clever artistic device, which is not immediately obvious. There are many other things going on there too, which I won't go into. Sorry? That's correct. It's very important. That you make a very important. Whoops, going the wrong way. That's right. Now you don't say. You don't look at it and say the fingers are abnormal, the arm is twisted abnormally, anatomically is incorrect, and all of that. Right? Because then you want to do that, you go and look at textbook of Gray's, Ana Gray's textbook of anatomy. Your beautiful anatomy there. It's nothing to do with anatomy. It's about uh, creating that mood of intimacy. And that the artist is successfully doing. You're right. I mean, there's a twist of the head, which is not realistic in some ways. Now I'm going to talk about another principle. And with this, we're almost done uh, in about five, 10 minutes. Uh, that is the principle of metaphor, visual metaphor. Now, when you think of metaphor and analogy, we think of literature. Like when uh, Tagore said of the Taj Mahal, it's a teardrop on the cheek of time, conveying the, the, the sadness of that great monument. At the same time, it's shaped like a teardrop. So there are multiple layers of metaphors that Tagore is in, invoking. Or when Shakespeare says, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. Juliet is the sun. Well, you don't say, does that mean she's a glowing ball of fire? Well, actually, schizophrenics do that, but there's another lecture. What all of us say is that, no, she's radiant like the sun, she's nurturing like the sun, she's warm like the sun, she rises in bed like the sun rises in the east, everything, you know, everything that comes to your mind. And Shakespeare was a master. So what a metaphor is, is linking seemingly unrelated things and a sort of a resonance between different layers of meaning. And you do the same thing in visual art, not just in literature and poetry. So let's take an example of this medieval nymph probably from Kajuraho. Again, I'm not sure of the exact location, but I know it's roughly 11th century. So first of all, the continuity of contour and the grouping principle, which I didn't talk about, 
and also the principle of contrast with the jewelry and her supple skin, peak shift and all of that. But something else going on there. She's looking heavenwards towards God, towards enlightenment, right? And it conveys that aspect of her. But also, a little bit more, less subtle is that those mangoes hanging on that arch, that bow of, of the tree there, are supposed to symbolize the fertility of spring, the, the, uh, uh, the fecundity and fertility of spring, of nature, echoed by her breasts, which also, the youthful breasts, also signify fecundity and fertility. So the mangoes become an echo, visual echo of her breast, but also a metaphorical echo of fertility. So all this, again, is conveyed by the artist, maybe unconsciously, maybe consciously, to evoke those images in your brain. Similarly, another example of metaphor, and if you want to go read more about all of this, you can read Heinrich Zimmer about Hindu art, uh, or Ananda Kumaraswamy about Hindu art. Um, so this is an example, I think it's of Lakshmi Narayanan, but it could equally be of Shiva and Parvati, but I think it's Lakshmi Narayanan, the cosmic couple. And look at how she got her arm around his neck. Now here I'm just wandering away from neuroscience, nothing to do with neuroscience, it's about connoisseurship of Indian art, okay? She's got her arm draped around him in intimacy, so the lines flow into each other, right? To convey that sense of intimacy and closeness. But also she's looking at his, his eyes, he's looking at the cosmos, and she's looking at his eyes, okay? And at first it looks like an interesting sculpture, she's leaning on him and has her arm over his shoulder. But there's many layers of meaning to it and metaphor. Fundamentally, what the artist is trying to convey is, although dual, although apparently double, the, the god and the goddess, there are actually two aspects of one single, of a unity. Okay? And in saying that, he's talking about all the dualities and polarities and antagonisms that you see in nature. For example, night and day, good and evil, yin and yang, uh, male and female. All of these are just dual aspects of a single cosmic reality. That's what he's trying to convey in that image. And of course, there are more obvious images like Ardha Narishwara, which I won't go into. But that's one of the things he's trying to convey in that image. Now, let me almost conclude. I've got two or three more slides. With another example of Chola bronzes. This is the cosmic, depicts the cosmic dance of Shiva. It's a South Indian Chola bronze going back to 11th, could be 12th, but probably 11th century. And uh, there's a beautiful example of this, a modern replica, which belongs to uh, Tom Levy and Elena, and they've kindly donated it to the museum, sorry, to the, uh, to the library. Loaned it. Oh, you loaned it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, they loaned it. Right. Okay. I think it looks so nice that it should remain here on permanent view. <laughs> okay, so I actually borrowed his joke, but anyhow. So, now, it's, of course, representing the cosmic dance of Shiva, um, surrounded by this aureole or this halo. And at, initially, it, it's a just beautifully poised, elegant sculpture. But there's a great deal more going on. It is supposed to symbolize the cosmic dance of the universe itself. It's not just Shiva. And the artist has used various clever devices to convey this. And as you look at it more and more, it becomes more and more beautiful. That's a great thing about about art, great works of art, unlike, you know, kitsch or art that's not great, each time you look at it, it becomes less and less interesting. The great art is the obvious. Each time you look at it, I'm looking at it for the hundredth time, and it's even more beautiful than the 99th time. It's like Beethoven's fifth. Each time you hear it, it's more beautiful. Each time you see this, it's more beautiful. So what's going on here? Well, as I said, at a literal level, it's a beautifully poised sculpture standing on this dwarf with the bent leg, which gives it that poise and balance, but there's a great deal of metaphor going on. As I said, it represents the, depicts the cosmic dance of Shiva and the dance of the cosmos itself. And the aureole here depicts the cyclical nature of time, the eternally cyclical nature of time. And, and these flames represent the punctuated nature of time and indeed represents the pulse beat of animate matter. So that's what he's conveying there. And to convey the dance, what he has done is to, first of all, of course, his, his movements. He's got the arms thrown out in, in sort of the centrifugal, or centripetal, I should say, energy of the arms going, flailing in different directions. But the hair also being thrown 
away from the face, conveying this agitation and movement and energy of the cosmos, which is the cosmic dance of Shiva. But in the midst of all this agitation and energy and movement is his supremely tranquil expression, conveying, and of course his bent leg, conveying stability and, and, and peace and eternity in the midst of all this agitation and frenzy and turmoil that you call the cosmos of the universe. By the way, let me pause here and to say, I'm not trying to preach any religion here, because I was raised as a Hindu, but I'm, as a scientist, I'm supposed to say I'm agnostic, okay? But I, my familiarity is mainly with Hindu, Hindu art and Indian art, so that's why I'm laboring this point, but it's equally true of many works of Western art, including Renaissance art. But going back to the Shiva Nataraja, so how amazing that the artist has conveyed in one image the seemingly antithetical elements of poise, repose, dignity, tranquility, and calmness on the one hand, and stability, which represents God and eternity, amidst all this frenzy and turmoil that we call the, the cosmos or the universe. But there's much more going on. That's just the beginning of it. Notice in his right hand, he's holding a tambour that is beating the, the rhythm of the cosmos, which echoes the rhythm of the flames, the punctuated na nature of the flames. But that's bringing the cosmos into existence, balanced out perfectly in his left hand by a flame, the flame of destruction. So creation and destruction balanced out precisely by the two hands. And then, look at his expression as well. It's tranquil, saying, I'm stable and calm and eternal. But at the same time, in some people think all Natraja images are the same. That's not true. You'll see a few more images. The iconography is similar, but each image is different. In some of them, there is a little enigmatic smile on the face of Shiva, as though he was smiling at life and death alike, and looking at his own creation, and sort of gently smiling at his own creation of the cosmos. Okay? So the expression is vital. And then you come down here, and there is this bent right leg, which is what gives the whole composition its, 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 its balance. Okay? And it's standing on this little hideous little dwarf. I don't know if people at the very back can see it. And what is that dwarf? It's called ignorance or maya or delusion. So what is this delusion that Shiva is crushing? It's a delusion that all of us scientists and mortals have that in reality, there's only one reality, and that is all of us are just a mindless agitation and movement of molecules. That's it, right? So he, and there's no deeper reality. So what Shiva is telling you is he's crushing this demon and saying behind appearances is a deeper reality, namely the supreme truth of God and Shiva. So dispel this illusion. The second illusion he's destroying is we all have this perception of ourselves. We arrive here briefly, momentarily on this planet. It's called life. And then it's snuffed out. It's called death. And it's all gone. It's all empty and dark. right? So what Shiva is trying to depict is the very nature of time. Many Western sculptures like Michelangelo's David brilliant, brilliantly uh, evokes a particular moment in time. What the Chola artist is trying to do is to depict the very nature of time. right? And he's saying, dispel this illusion that you arrive here and you're merely a spectator watching the events in the cosmos. Realize that you are not a spectator who arrives here momentarily. You are in fact part of the great dance of Shiva, great dance of the cosmos. And once that realization occurs, you attain moksha and you become one with the cosmos, one with the supreme reality of Shiva. So fear not, be happy. Okay? That's what he's saying. Right? And then he's saying once you've dispelled the illusion of Maya, seek solace under my raised left foot. And, I, and then he says he's blessing the devotee for having attained moksha, enlightenment. And then he says with his right hand with the Abhaya Mudra saying, and all will be well because there is no such thing as death and birth. You're one with the cosmos in reality. So all of these layers of metaphor in this beautiful bronze icon, which you're going to see in a few minutes, but the English Victorians arrived in India, and Sir George Birdwood, who was a great Indian art historian, I shouldn't say great, but he's an Indian art historian. By the way, I have nothing against the English. I have very close English friends. I'm talking about 19th century reaction. So this Englishman, Lord B uh, Sir Birdwood, come and looked at it, and he said, it's a multi-armed monstrosity. How can a human being have four arms and uh, legs and all of this. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so it's, it's, it's primitive art. 
Now, if I had been around at that time, I would say, what about angels depicted in Victorian paintings, you know, with these wings sprouting off babies? And as a medical man, I can tell you, I have seen babies with multiple arms. You see it in freak shows, you see it in teratology anatomy museums. But a child, a baby with wings is anatomically impossible, right? So what I'm driving at, Philistine, I just couldn't see the many layers of metaphors being conveyed by this great work of art. Now you're going to see many examples, just other examples. Here's another Nataraja, completely different. Again, conveying the uh, dance of Shiva, different expression, different movements, different position, everything is different. And I can show you a hundred images, but I won't go on and on. Um, that shows Saint Sammandar, the little child saint, dancing and abandoned because suddenly he realized the truth, that he's one with Shiva. And he's pointing heavenwards with his index finger, saying, I have, I have realized the truth, right? And the great thing about Chola bronzes, by the way, and I'm going to conclude very soon, is many things have been said about Chola bronzes. You should all go read about it. But to me, the great thing is it combines more elegantly and more effectively than any other form of art in the world the human and the divine. It's that perfect balance between the human and the divine that the Chola artist strives to achieve. And that's what he has succeeded admirably. How did he think of that image even? or the image of the Nataraja. I mean, how did he even think of that? So that's Saint Samandar, who has attained en enlightenment and is dancing in joy is, abundant, uh, joy is abandoned. That is Krishna having just vanquished evil in, 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 in a Rakshasa, the Naga Rakshasa. Uh, I maybe I'm a bit confused about Indian mythology here, but, <laughs> but liberating moksha, right? And then standing triumphantly there, blessing all of mankind for having liberated us from from the evil of the snake. And you can go on and on and on. That, that shows you a lovely example. Actually, it's from Sri Lanka, which had a lot of Chola, Chola art moved from India in medieval times to Sri Lanka. They developed their own artistic style, which is very similar to Sri Lanka, except there's a Buddhist influence too. And that's one of my favorite images, showing again that beautiful poise and elegance. And look at his face and his slightly tilted had, you're going to see something like this in the little Parvati from my collection of Diane sitting over there in the, in the, in the gallery. Um, okay, so what else? Um, I think we'll go back to Nataraja and say, um, I'd like to conclude with that. This has been a sort of a montage of science, neuroscience, connoisseurship of art, art history, Indian history, and everything else. Um, hope you liked it. Thank you. <laughs>